<laughs> in a sense. Do you have a comment then on um, talking about zeitgeist? Do you have a comment before we ask this, go to the questioners, about the, the sudden prevalence of this enormous interest in the topic that we are talking about? I mean, would you say it's because of the debate about intelligent design? Would you say it's post 9-11? Well, uh, okay, so you're talking really, really recent history now. You're talking, you're yes. Talk yes. Yeah. Um, well, in America, uh, I think it might be something to do with 9-11. I think it might be something to do with Bush, actually. And I think it might be that, that um, perhaps people are getting a bit fed up with um, what many people are now seeing as a slide towards an American theocracy, uh, an American Taliban. I've certainly noticed, on, I've, just, I've just come to the end now of about a three-week uh, book promotion tour of the United States in which I've visited a fair slice of the country, including Kansas and uh, Virginia, um, Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, and what struck me is I got a far more enthusiastic response than I ever expected to get. And it seemed that the more outspoken I was in my attacks on religion, the louder the cheer, the foot stamping cheer that I got. Uh, and the loudest cheer of all, I think, was when I said something like, you atheists are far more numerous than you realize. You've been cowed into thinking that you're a downtrodden, rare breed in America. Well, I don't believe you are. All you have to do is stand up, recognize each other, and if enough of you do that, there will be a critical mass, and you'll become a, a, a significant lobby. After all, even opinion polls show that, that, that you outnumber religious Jews. And the Jewish lobby is notoriously uh, effective in Washington. Why isn't there an an effective atheist lobby with as much political muscle as its numbers would seem to warrant. And remarks like that were the ones that I got the greatest cheer from in places like Kansas and Lynchburg, Virginia. So right. I, I think maybe, Roger, you're right that there is some, something going on in, yeah, in this it, country. It, if I may use a, uh, the term loosely, you, 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 you may have been preaching to the converted though? In the... I was preaching to the converted. I was preaching to the choir. But what surprised me was how big the choir seems to be and how enthusiastic. Well, And I think maybe Sam had the, has had the same impression. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, this uh, change in the zeitgeist is uh, really a very remar remarkable uh, thing in our lifetime. It, it has changed. Uh, but certainly you're not a Hegelian about this. Uh, there's no sort of metaphysical necessity involved in this, and you would certainly accept that this could reverse itself very, very quickly. Um, so, and, and I quite agree that, that this advance, this improvement is independent of religion, it's independent of religious beliefs, positive or negative. Would, it, would, would you uh, like to remark about how dependent it might be on our ecological good fortune. We are, we are in a bubble, um, and um, it, it could happen that uh, population uh, increases and uh, consumption increases could destabilize natural systems, and in fact already have. Um, all the life, uh, the major life support systems of the planet are presently in a state of serious decline. It could get ugly in a hurry. Uh, in which case uh, we could revert to tribalism very, very yes, quickly. So I, this I, could fall apart in a yeah. hurry. Uh, I, I mean, I, I fear you could be right. Um, first, I, I totally agree that there's nothing, there's nothing inevitable and, and deterministic about a sort of ever and onward, upward trend. Um, I think that, like so many trends, that, that it's a sort of sawtooth, it, it zigzags about, and we may be in a temporary reversal at, at the moment, for, for example. Um, but uh, I, I think it, I, I see it as rather analogous to Moore's law, which you know is the empirical law that computer power doubles every 18 months. So it's an exponential increase in computer power which doubles every 18 months. And purely as an empirical finding, it's been holding true, I think, for at least 
30 years, which is rather a remarkable thing for a law that nobody has any real explanation for. And if you ask computer science experts what causes Moore's law, they will say, oh, it's an amalgam of all sorts of different things happening. Uh, and um, there's no one, one cause of it. Um, it's something to do, perhaps it's a sort of um, co-evolution between hardware advances and software advances, and each software advance um, calls forth a new hardware advance to, to take advantage. I mean, you could say something of that sort. But it's, I think it's a kind of complicated mixture of different factors. After all, we're talking about lots of different manufacturers, lots of different new technological advances, lots of programmers writing new software, and yet, d despite the, dis the, the disparate nature of all, all these things entering into Moore's law, it follows an astonishingly accurate straight line on a, on a log scale. Um, well, maybe the, the moral zeitgeist is a bit like that. There's no, there's no one cause of it, but, it's, um, but it's, an, it's an amalgam of different things. Now, your final pessimistic point about if, if the world suddenly um, goes, goes to hell, I mean, if, we're, if, we, if global warming and mass starvation and flooding and things Maybe then we'll all revert to a to a, a, a more primitive state, and and um, I I don't know. I mean, you you could be right. I uh, I've seen Al Gore's film about um, global warming, and it's pretty scary stuff. It makes you weep too when you think what we could have had. Joan, you have a mic. Um, Joan Roughgarden. Um, uh, thanks, Richard. I appreciated your talk very much, and I'd, I'd like to actually focus some attention on the notion of the selfish gene. And um, I also really ap appreciate and value the concept of the selfish gene and think of it as especially helpful um, in the aftermath of all the discussion of group selection 20 years ago and, and um, its effectiveness in pr projecting, if you will, the insights from G.C. Williams and and yourself. Um, today, though, um, I'm concerned that uh, we're not spending enough attention on the notion of an individual f from a biological standpoint. And uh, I'm pr concerned that, um, that the notion of an individual has been unanalyzed uh, sufficiently in biology, and that the selfish gene, uh, it's not so much the selfishness as you pointed out, which is the issue as much as the gene and the need to rethink uh, the atomic nature of genes. And this comes up in connection with genetics, of course, with the team play or the joint play of genes in agreeing to work together in chromosomes and to be transmitted together in chromosomes. And it pertains to um, uh, fitnesses of individuals where the individuals are working in teams and the success of an individual depends on the team that they're in, and so can't be attributed to one of them as an individual. And, um, and so this destabilizes even the possibility of phrases like survival of the fittest, because we don't know, you know who the entity was that survived. And then, as you know, there are lots of species in which the notion of an individual, a biological individual is typically taken as one genome in one body. And there are many species in which one genome leads to multiple bodies, as in clonal forms, and many species in which multiple genomes co-reside in a single body, as in endosymbiosis of many sorts. And um, so I guess my observation that I, I wonder if you might comment on is how we would extend and go beyond the notion of the selfish gene as we've had it up right. till now to address these situations in which uh, the notion of the individual is especially problematic. Thank you. Um, let, let me deal with that. I, I want to leave on one side the two final rather special cases of, of, of cloning organisms and um, endosymbiosis where whole genomes may be imported. They're, they're complications which I could deal with, but there probably won't be time. I do want to talk about the, what I think is a largely semantic disagreement about the role of genes versus individuals. I have never um, denied the salience and importance of the individual organism as a unit. Um, it clearly is an extremely important unit, and I've used the word vehicle to distinguish from replicator. And I'm, I'm not, I've never ever wanted vehicles and replicators to be seen as in opposition to each other. They are both part of the process. They are 
in a sense, complementary. Now, when one talks about genes forming teams, that again is right, but there are two different ways of looking at that. You could say entire teams of genes get favored versus rival teams of genes, and no doubt that sometimes happens. But the other thing that happens, which looks superficially similar, is where genes remain atomistic in your, in your terms, but what they are favored for is their capacity to flourish and survive in the presence of each other. And so teams of genes are, in a sense, to be seen in a different way. The entire gene pool of a species could be regarded as a team in the sense that every gene in the gene pool of a species can expect at some time in its career down the generations to find itself rubbing shoulders with other members of the same gene pool within the species, though not, except in exceptional cases, though not with members of gene pools of other species. So the gene pool of a species really is like a pool, and it's an environment in which every gene interacts with the other genes at any one moment inside individual bodies and only inside individual bodies. But in the long term, and it is only genes that can look to a long term at all, in the long term, those genes uh, rub shoulders with any other genes in the gene pool because of sexual uh, recombination. So um, I think that, I, I suspect we don't disagree. I mean, I think, I think that, um, that worrying about giving too much emphasis to the gene or the individual um, is a matter of rhetoric which is which is unhelpful. I, it's a thing I've noticed in, for example, our colleague Franz de Waal, who is, is always um, going on about how there's been too much emphasis on selfishness and, and struggle and, and strife and not enough on, on cooperation. And that's, just, that's a wrong way of looking at it. I've always emphasized cooperation and um, genes working together. They work together because it's in their own self-interest to do so. They need to work together with the other genes that they're likely to meet in the gene pool of the species. And the proximal, immediate, short-term environment in which they work together is indeed the individual body. And individual bodies are vastly complicated machines which are built, as it happens, by the particular set of genes that are in them. But the overall design of an individual body is the design that has been perfected over many, many, many different bodies by different combinations of the same genes from the same gene pool down through the generations. I think it's a very complicated but, but fascinating picture. And, and I, I don't sort of resonate to the, um, to the opposition that, um, that you may be tempted to give between um, the importance of the individual versus the importance of the gene. They are both complementarily important.